Well, it's a real pleasure to be here at Photonics West, um, particularly to give one of these plenary talks. It's, a, it's an honor uh, at this amazing meeting that, uh, that uh, happens every year in San Francisco. Um, so I'm going to talk about emerging applications of these strange microstructured fibers that we call them photonic crystals when they look periodic. Um, many, many interesting physical uh, effects can be seen in these fibers, as I hope you'll, you'll learn during the talk. Um, but just before I start, of course, this work is the work done not just by members of my group, and that's a picture of them in uh, the middle of last year, but also lots and lots of colleagues and friends from other groups that we're collaborating with, some of whom are in that picture. So just to start out, um, uh, let me very briefly introduce photonic crystal fiber, or PCF. Um, it comes in two varieties. It's the simple story, at least. The first sort is the solid core photonic crystal fiber, so named because, oddly enough, the core is solid glass. Um, but the interesting thing about the structure is that it has um, hollow shells uh, in the cladding uh, around the core. And um, so the, the, the boundary between the core and the cladding is not continuous, it's discontinuous. Um, so it's not quite the same thing as a step index fiber. There's some interesting subtlety here. Um, uh, but g even given that, it still guides by total internal reflection with, with some interesting um, uh, extra properties which allow you to filter out the, the, the higher order modes. So we can prevent the higher order modes from being guided uh, just by the way, the way we design these, these, these hollow channels that, that are arranged around, around the core. Um, so, okay, so that, that's the first sort. Um, the second kind is, is the more revolutionary, and this is the, the hollow core uh, photonic crystal fiber, which, um, because the core is hollow, of course, the refractive index of the core is, is now less than that of the cladding, at least on average. So, so you don't have the option of guidance by total internal reflection. You could try and guide by total external reflection, but that's not as, not as efficient. Um, you don't get very low loss that way. So the original idea uh, here was back in 91, I, was, I, I wanted to pull together photonic band gaps and optical fibers, see if we couldn't come up with something useful uh, and interesting uh, in the form of a hollow core fiber with very low loss. So we could have a very narrow, hollow channel within which the light is trapped. Uh, potentially over kilometer distances. That was the original idea. It turns out more recently, as I'm going to talk about uh, later, uh, that these come in two varieties, the photonic band gap um, variety of holocore fiber and the, um, another kind which I call anti-resonant reflection, which is not quite a band gap. It's getting towards being a band gap, but it isn't quite there, but nevertheless gives you pretty good uh, low loss guidance over a few meters, which is good for many applications. So holocore and solcore, those are the two kinds. Let me, let me talk first, first about um, some recent work on solid core photonic crystal fiber. Now, now one of the most exciting applications of solid core photonic crystal fiber has been supercontinuum generation. So there are companies selling boxes which contain a length of PCF pumped by a pulsed laser, uh, and that's what produces the very intense broadband white light. I'm not going to talk about that today. That's an established thing. It's almost emerged. It's not emerging. But let me talk uh, about something different. I'd like to tell you about twisted photonic crystal fiber and uh, uh, solid core photonic crystal fiber and its ability to preserve circular, by, uh, circular polarization state and also preserve the the sign and the magnitude of orbital angular momentum of light. So this is the kind of fiber we're talking about. There's the straight variety on the left. And uh, you can see my laser point is dying. So if someone had a brighter one, that would be great. Um, but the, the one on the right is twisted uh, for obvious reasons. That's the term we use. They both guide by total internal reflection in this case. Now, there's an interesting difference between these two structures. If we imagine, uh, just, just by way of illustration, that the mode, the optical mode sitting in the core in the center, those little red dots, by the way, are hollow channels. The rest of it is glass. So the light is sitting in the solid glass core, and it's not going to be perfectly circular because the hollow channels will distort its shape clearly. So when the mode travels along this structure, uh, on the left, it doesn't start, just doesn't spin, but on the right, it's forced to spin as it, as it travels. So they're not the same. I mean, you might think, well, it hardly makes any difference twisting the fiber unless you twist it really fast. But it turns out uh, this, this, uh, this, this, the, the fact that the, the, the structure and the cladding forces the mode to spin, what this does is, is to induce optical activity in a very beautiful way. 
in a structure which has no linear birefringence in the first place. So this is very unlike some earlier work that was done uh, with, uh, with spun fibers in the, in the early days of fiber optics, the idea being to use them for Faraday effect current sensing and magnetic field sensing. Uh, this is an almost perfectly, this is a perfectly circularly bifringent uh, structure. Um, in fact, if you're interested in looking back into the early days here, um, this, this, um, this paper here by Khan Hussey and one of, his, one of his students back in 1986 proposed that a structure like this could indeed give you optical activity. So I'm not going to talk too much about that. I want to get on to orbital angular momentum. So there's a picture of the fiber again. And uh, the way we make the fiber in this case, uh, well, there are two ways we do it. One of them is a post-processing rig. There's a picture of it operating. You basically twist the fiber as you heat up the, thank you very much. You twist the fiber as you heat up the, um, the, the heat it up with a carbon dioxide laser, which is coming in here. That's a mirror. You can see a little white dot, and you probably saw it actually as it scans along. You soften the glass, and then one end is fixed, and the other end is, is spinning, so you end up with a helically twisted uh, swirl, if you like, of, of hollow channels going around the core. Um, you can also do this, and we're doing this routinely now. You can also do it, do it during the fiber drawing process. Um, uh, that has the advantage that you can make very long lengths, although you can't make quite such a small pitch as you can in this post-processing step. And that's an optical micro graph of what you see in a, in a microscope looking into the side of the fiber after it's been twisted. Um, you, you see that six of these periods corresponds to one helical period, it turns out, because of the six hollow channels or the six-fold symmetry of the structure itself. So, unexpected was the observation when we started playing with these fibers. I wasn't sure you'd see anything interesting. Um, but then uh, when we had a look at the transmission spectrum, we saw these curious dips appearing um, in, in the spectrum, very, very uh, characteristic. And uh, if you made a longer sample, or uh, uh, you could actually get these to be very deep, maybe 30, 40 dB, 50 dB deep. Um, and there's a whole series of them. And interestingly, as you change the twist rate, so, it, so reduce the pitch, the helical pitch, the, the, the dips move out to, um, to longer wavelength for, for higher twist rates. In fact, this had been observed originally by Shin and co-workers in that, that optical communications article here uh, earlier, 2009. They didn't quite explain what they had observed. They were the first people to do this and, and see these dips. So um, what's actually causing these dips? This, this is an interesting phenomenon. Um, a, a very sharp dip in transmission could be, can be useful for many things. So what, how does, what's actually going on? It took us quite some time to work this out. If we think about the light in the, in the cladding of the structure, so we're thinking about the, what we call the fundamental space filling mode, the, the mode that fills the entire cladding if it was infinite, then it's going to consist of a whole lot of blobs of light that are sort of stuck between the hollow channels. They're held in place by the hollow channels. Um, so if, if you put light into the cladding, it's going to describe a helical path as it travels along. So it's going to go at some angle to the axis of the fiber. It's, the phi will not be zero, so it'll go off at some angle. We can then take the refractive index of that mode, resolve it into an azimuthal component and a component along the axis, and, and z. And this azimuthal component, as you might expect, since it's going to be going round in a circle, it, it, it can become discretized by, by a resonance. So we take the wave vector in this direction, we multiply by the, by the circumference, and choose a radius, and we end up with, uh, with, it, with this condition, that the wavelength of one of these resonances times the, the number of periods of the light as you go round here, which in fact is the same as the orbital angular momentum order, would have to be proportional to the twist rate and a number of bunch of constants here. So we have a relationship that says the dip wavelength is proportional to the twist rate, which is exactly what you see in the experiments. In fact, the agreement is, is really remarkably beautiful and, and good. So the twist rate is here. This is the wavelength of, of four of the dips that we looked at with many, many different samples and different twist rates. And you find indeed that the dip wavelengths are proportional to one over the helical pitch, which makes this nothing like a long period grating, in case anyone, anyone was thinking it was, uh, because the, the, the resonances are happening, happening in the azimuthal direction, not along the axis. So we end up with this, this, uh, this relationship. And in fact, if we have a look at this structure, these, these modes that form in the cladding, and these are finite element modeling results of the, of the actual modes in the cladding, they're ring-shaped. And they're very leaky, it turns out, as well. Um, there's nothing to confine them as you move further right from, from the axis, it turns out. Um, but um, 
we can nevertheless, by taking this simple equation, we were able to identify the OIM order of, of the modes that we measured in the experiment. And these are pictures of the modes as, as they appear in the finite element modeling. Quite a complex pattern. There's, the, uh, there's OAM order 5, 6, 7, 8, um, which fit perfectly to the experimental data. So let me just spend a minute or so, because this is really a quite a curious mode. It takes a while to understand what's going on. Um, if we think about block waves, OK, maybe not all that many of you have worked with block waves, but this is a very useful concept here. This is a kind of azimuthal block wave. It's a helical block wave. It's periodic as you go around the circle. So the pattern repeats. As you can see, it repeats six times. So the field describing the block wave will consist of some axial, com axial phase, phase uh, component along the axis of the fiber. But then transversely, we will have an azimuthally periodic function. You can see it plotted here periodic function, which is a function of phi, the angle, and minus alpha z, alpha is the twist. So this, this pattern twists as it travels. So it's doing this as it travels along as a result of the twist. So we're forcing the block wave to spin. So that's why I call it a helical block wave. Um, and then we have, um, uh, so this is periodic. And we need this here because we want it to repeat every 60 degrees. So that's the reason why this thing is here. And then we need something else here. So we got a perfectly periodic function, which is periodic with the azimuth. But we also need some term describing a phase progression, a kind of phase velocity of some sort that's going around the circle. And this is a different term. And this, is, this in fact, is related to the block wave vector. And it's psi, I called it here. So in fact, if we just look at this, what we find is that the, the, this, this term here will go from, say, 1, this is the reference phase, to i, e to the i psi b. 2 psi b, 3 psi b, 4 and 5, and so on as, as we go around. So there's going to be a, a phase advance for that particular term as we go around the circumference. And if we work out the number of periods that, that this, this gives you, it's in fact we can then work out the OAM order for the harmonics of this block wave. And they turn out to look like this. So we have 3 times psi b. This is the, this is the, um, the, the block uh, phase divided by pi plus 6 times the n, where n is the harmonic of the block wave. Anyway, we can explain this. These, these modes have multiple values of orbital angular momentum. They have multiple values of this L. And, and this, in fact, is what gives rise to these complex patterns. So something we wanted to do was to go a little further. We didn't really like the fact that these modes were leaky. We didn't want to lose the light. It could be useful in some applications, but I was interested in looking at a structure where the light had six folds, where the, the cores had six fold symmetry. Here's a picture of one, six cores and nothing in the middle. Um, and if we twist it, what will happen? Well, once again, we can put in our modes, and you can see that on the right, this six, these, these cores will be, will be twisting as they travel. And the, the, the light would be perfectly confined in these cores. It wouldn't be able to leak, to leak away. Um, and uh, so, so this, this, this was interesting, because this would mean we could, actually, we could actually measure the OAM, the orbital angular momentum of these modes. In the previous case, all we could see were dips in the spectrum. The actual mode itself was very rapidly lost from the structure, so it was hard to characterize it. But here, we're able to actually characterize these modes. And one of the things we find, in fact, just to cut a, a long story uh, a little bit short here, is that um, in terms of block waves, these helical block waves, this is the propagation constant along the axis. And this is the azimuthal value of the orbital angular momentum. The block waves, when you actually have a tilted periodic structure, which is what happens when you twist the fiber, so they're no longer parallel, but they go off at an angle, we find that the block wave that progresses in the clockwise direction has a different propagation constant from the one that progresses in the, in the anti-clockwise direction. In other words, the, the mode with OAM order 1 plus 1 has a different propagation constant from the mode with the uh, OAM order minus 1. So for the first time, we have a fiber which is able to give you to, is able to preserve this, not just the magnitude of OAM, but also the sign. So it's, it's, an, it's a new kind of birefringence. We have linear birefringence, we have circular birefringence, and now we have OAM birefringence in these structures. Here is a picture for our simpler structure with three cores. This is basically the refractive index of the two modes, the plus one and the minus one. And you can see we get a splitting that actually scales linearly, it turns out, with the twist rate. So we, we can get a splitting between the plus and the minus OAM orders. Uh, so this means that we can preserve the sign and magnitude of these, of these modes. 
And it works. So we've made 50 meter lengths of, of uh, twisted fiber in the drawing tower, carefully arranged to launch uh, each of these, these individual modes. The six core structure supports actually six, six different modes, four of which carry quite a bit of OAM. And these are the pictures of the four of those. So the first one we see here has OAM order mi minus two. And we see there are two spirals superimposed. This, this, in fact, is the interference pattern between the mode emerging from the end of the fiber and a Gaussian beam. This is, this is, the, this is the conventional way, or one of the nice ways of visualizing the OAM order. And we go to the minus one, we have a single spiral. Plus one, we have a spiral going the other direction. And plus two, we have two spirals going in the other direction. And these OAM modes are strongly preserved. You can bend the fiber, wind it up on a spool, and, and, and still find that the, the, the mode is preserved as it travels along. So we're very excited by this, both from a fundamental point of view, but also in terms of potential applications. Um, if you wanted to have a fiber that uh, produced a mode that had pure OAM order for some reason, for example, in laser tweezer applications. So just uh, my second topic here um, has to do with, um, with uh, optoacoustic mode locking that was briefly mentioned in the, in the introduction. Um, so this, this, is, uh, th this is an experiment that started out as a, just a, one of those funny ideas you have when you, you're feeling bored um, or you can't think of what to do. Um, I was, uh, well, I've been quite fascinated by the interaction of sound and light for a very long time. Um, and uh, of course, many of you working in fiber optics are, are familiar with the, 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 a, couple of t a couple of different experiments that were, were, were done back in the 1980s and, and early 1990s. And these had to do with the interaction between, between acoustic vibrations of the entire fiber structure in a single mode fiber and light in the core. And one of these, uh, these were quantum optics guys uh, who were trying to do squeezing. They were trying to squeeze the states of the light um, and uh, they find that there was a terrible amount of, of interference and noise caused by, by acoustic vibrations in the, in the cross-section of the fiber. And this is really annoying in their experiments, and they wanted to get rid of it. And they thought of a, a, an acronym, which was GOBS, G-A-W-B-S. And I think they, they used that because they didn't like these resonances very much. It doesn't sound very attractive, GOBS, at least in English. Um, the other application here was the, from the group of Dianov in Moscow, and he realized that if a short pulse was going along a fiber, a very short pulse, picosecond pulse, let's say, it creates a shock wave as it travels at a point along the fiber. And then, so it will create a wave that, through electrostriction that will travel outwards, hit the outer boundary, and come back in. And if it just so happens that the next pulse coming along coincides with that acoustic wave coming and back and hitting it, you, you get a long-range interaction between the pulses and the acoustic vibration. They were able to observe this, but it's a very weak effect, and, and you can't really do very much with it, although it is interesting in, in fundamental terms. In PCF, however, we can make a very tiny core and surround it with, with basically empty space, or pretty much empty space. We get very strongly confined acoustic vibrations in the core, um, and, so we have, and we also have almost perfect overlap between the guided mode in the core and the acoustic vibrations in the core. So we have, we have a kind of a, a stage for, for playing around with the very intense optoacoustic interactions. Let me just illustrate this. So here uh, is a picture of frequency wave vectors for, um, first of all, an acoustic mode in the core. And I think we can see here, this, this is a simulation of one of these modes, a breathing mode in the core. It will have a dispersion relation, something like this, frequencies of a few gigahertz with a cutoff frequency of two, a few gigahertz and a very flat dispersion shape. The optical dispersion over a range of maybe 10 gigahertz is more or less a straight line. So if we pump this system with two, two laser frequencies separated by the cutoff frequency of the acoustic vibration, we can generate, we find we can generate a lot of extra sidebands by what I call Raman-like scattering. It really is very, very similar to Raman scattering. Uh, except that we're replacing molecules with this, this, this acoustic vibration in the core. Um, OK, it does actually work. So this is just very briefly one of the early experiments. You pump with a strong pump and a Stokes signal, send it into the fiber, choose the frequency difference to match the resonant frequency in the core, which is 1.8 gigahertz here, and you get strong conversion from the pump to the Stokes. You can amplify Stokes signal in this way, and you deplete the pump. Um, and then we see that some sidebands are appearing in the spectrum coming out here, not just the first Stokes, but we get uh, higher order Stokes and anti-Stokes signals. 
um, in, in this system. And if you pump it hard, you can get lots and lots of sidebands generated uh, uh, very, very easily in this system. Um, and in fact, you can get very good agreement with Raman scattering theory uh, to, 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 so it really, uh, it's a perfect toy model for Raman scattering, in fact. So recently what we've been doing, uh, uh, just briefly, we've been putting one of these fibers into a fiber ring laser. It's an Airbnb fiber amplifier. It has lots of components here which are arranged to make it, uh, we're cloning, uh, controlling the dispersion too to make it on average anomalous. So we have a soliton fiber laser. Um, we wanted to go in one direction. There's an isolator. We've got um, a saturable absorber system in, in here as well. You need that in order to get solitons. But the key component is the solid core PCF. It's only a short length of it. And it's one of these modes that we're using to mode lock the fiber laser. And now the, the fundamental round trip frequency is about 17 megahertz. And by doing this, we were able to force it to mode lock at 2.211 gigahertz, it turns out, which is the close to the frequency of the resonance of the core in the PCF. Um, and it, it, because the the interaction here is so intense, it's a very, very strong interaction. We have a, a very stable system. It runs for days without drifting. It's, it's like using a quartz oscillator, as you have in, a, in one of the old-fashioned, what would be, the, even the modern ones have this, I don't know. But um, a quartz oscillator, because the material in the core is quartz, um, and the frequency is, is very well-defined. And here you see the results of uh, autocorrelation trace. You can see the Kelly sidebands, which are characteristic of a soliton laser. Um, and in this case, we were getting down to durations of about, about half a, a picosecond. More recently, we've been getting down to close to 100 femtoseconds with this system. But the beauty is that it's so stable. It doesn't require any electronics. It just sits there and it mode locks. Um, you don't have to do anything. OK, let me see. So my next series of topics um, have to do with, um, with Holocore PCF and what you can do with that. Um, and I'd like just to introduce this a little bit by discussing uh, just briefly these anti-resonant reflecting PCFs. I call them ARR PCFs um, for want of a better term. Um, there's quite a lot of interest in this. There's been a lot of papers over the last uh, sort of five, six years, various groups in, in Moscow and the States and in France, and uh, we've been working on this as well, who, who've come up with some very simple designs that give you losses of order of decibel per meter um, which is much higher than you'd get in a photonic band gap structure. It's a different mechanism here, uh, but they're extremely simple structures, and they guide over a very, very broad bandwidth of, of frequencies, thousands of nanometers. The key here is designing the very first layer in the structure. So if we take a Kagome structure, such as the one on, on right here, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, uh, it's the first layer of the Kagome that's, that's really important, because it doesn't have a photonic band gap. So you have the first barrier to the light escaping is the most important one. So in fact, that's what these are. It's like taking the first row and re just making them a different way, and this one also. So, so anyway, with this type of fiber, you can, get, you can enhance the interaction between a laser, focused laser beam and a gas by factors of about 10,000 times. And what does this do for you? Well. It's, uh, we have long, well-controlled path lengths where the dispersion is very well-controlled. We have broadband guidance, good for short pulses. And we have a very low light glass overlap, it turns out. So the damage threshold is very high. But the most wonderful thing from a point of view of an experimentalist, the guy in the lab, is that by just by turning a knob, you can change the dispersion landscape. So the empty fiber itself, the hollow fiber, has anomalous dispersion over pretty much its entire range, right down into the highest frequencies. It remains anomalous. That's a characteristic of hollow waveguides. And so when we add gas to the core, the gas has normal dispersion, and this lifts the whole landscape up in the process, creating a zero dispersion point that is, that is tunable. So that's 30 atmospheres, two atmospheres, and so on. You get some idea of the scale. Now, the reason this works is that the intrinsic dispersion of this, this, this waveguide is really very small. So it's small enough so that the dispersion of the gas is able to counterbalance the anomalous dispersion of the core, it, core itself over a huge frequency range. So we have a very beautiful system here for playing with, with, uh, with nonlinear optics. And one of the things you can do is extreme pulse compression. So here is one of the experiments. We're launching in a soliton. It happens to be of order 7, so it's not a fundamental soliton. These are its characteristics, 30 femtoseconds, about a microjoule of energy, five atmospheres of argon gas. You, you can't see there's not much happening here, but something seems to happen at the end. If you run some modeling on this, 
we find that the pulse, this 30 frames per second pulse, is undergoing self-compression and it is reaching a temporal focus at the end of the fiber. So this is the, the pulse duration. You can see it being compressed. This is through self-phase modulation, well-known effect uh, that happens to high rotor solitons as they travel along. Um, and meanwhile, the bandwidth, of course, increases. It has to for getting a shorter pulse. And we see something interesting happening here. I'm going to come to that in a moment. But just, just to stand back a little bit, this is a very, very simple way of taking a pulse uh, of energy, a few microjoules, and compressing it down to close to single cycle duration. It's extremely simple. It's tunable. You just change the pressure. You can, you can adjust the system until you get what you want. Um, and uh, the damage threshold, as I say, is very high. And in fact, this has allowed us to study ionization effects and plasma formation. I don't want to talk about that today, however. And needless to say, lots of groups have, uh, are getting involved in this and publishing nice papers. Um, these are just some of the examples. That's a group in, in Vienna and Moj. This is, again, Limoges working with the Institut d'Optique and Amplitude Systems. MPQ in Garching is working with us. Uh, ETH is involved, Ursula Keller. Lots of people are getting excited about this as a possibility. But uh, what I'd like to tell you, though, now is, is just um, uh, what you can do with this uh, afterwards. And this, this is something that we are getting more and more excited about. Um, not only can you compress the pulse, but it turns out the system has the right characteristics to allow you to generate what we call a dispersive wave at, in the ultraviolet, a very bright, uh, tunable, dispersive wave in the, in, the, in, the, in the vacuum and deep ultraviolet. And here, these modeling results show you that very clearly. So at the point of maximum compression, uh, the bandwidth is enormous. The pulse begins to feel the effects of higher order dispersion as a result. It, al you, it also feels the effects of self-steepening and shock formation. All these things come together to create a, a burst of radiation, of linear radiation, that's why we call it dispersive, linear radiation in the vacuum ultraviolet. It's very dramatic in the experiment. You can see the fiber lighting up after the temporal focus. Um, and um, I'm not pushing the right button here. So why does this actually happen? Um, well, here is, the, <coughs> here is the frequency wave vector diagram for, for a system that has some beta 2 and no, no higher order dispersion. It, it has a kind of curvature that goes upwards as it travels, so this is characteristic of anomalous dispersion. When we add nonlinearity, we cancel out the curvature and we end up with a straight line. So this is the dispersion relation of the soliton. All the frequencies have the same group velocity, so the pulse doesn't disperse. If we add some higher order dispersion at beta 3 to this system, then we create a zero dispersion point, and we go from normal dis anomalous dispersion to normal dispersion, where it's tilting over like this. That's normal dispersion. As a result, the, the uh, curve for the linear system overlaps with the straight line for the soliton, and we have a point where there is phase matching, where the dispersive wave appears. Um, and uh, because everything here is pressure tunable, just by changing the pressure of the gas, we can, change, we can tune the wavelength of this ultraviolet light over a very wide range from the vacuum ultraviolet uh, in, into the visible. So it's a completely reconfigurable. You, change the, you can change the gas. You can change the pressure. Um, and uh, here's just an example of the tunability that we can achieve working with xenon, krypton, argon, neon, all the way from the vacuum ultraviolet to the visible. And more recently, we've been pushing very hard into the, uh, the vacuum ultraviolet using neon in this case. And here we're using helium. So the, the, the lighter the gas, the higher the ionization of the gas, the, the further you can go into the, into the ultraviolet. And this is basically a super continuum in the vacuum ultraviolet here. And if you, if you compress that spectrum, and we have no reason to believe it's not uh, coherent, we'd get down to a pulse that was in the outer second range. Um, so what if, here's one of these what if questions. OK, you've been working with noble gases. I didn't mention why. Well, initially, we thought we don't want any Raman scattering. It's going to just mess the, make the whole thing very complicated. Do we really want it? Uh, so we work with noble gases. Actually, that's what the high harmonic people do as well. They work, tend to work, or have done anyway, work with, with noble gases. Then we thought, well, you know, why don't we have a look at a Raman active gas? This might be, might be quite interesting. So we replaced the argon, krypton, or whatever it was, with, with hydrogen. And we, we got some very nice modeling tools developed by Wang Gyun Chang and John Travers in my group. This is a full field equation, unidirectional, including every possible effect you can think of. Um, and in hydrogen, 
there are two main modes of Raman excitation. One is the vibrational, which is at about 125 terahertz, and the rotational one, which is at, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, at 18 terahertz. So what, let's just think about what's happening. We launch our 30 femtosecond pulse into the system. Here it is. This is at the entrance, well, after six centimeters. It's already short enough to, uh, to be able to impulsively excite some of those rotations of the molecules. In other words, this sort of thing. It's already short enough to do that because the pulse duration is less than half a cycle of this. So you, you can get some rotational stuff going. And then as the pulse self-compresses through self-phase modulation, because this also happens in hydrogen, here we are at 9 femtoseconds, and you're beginning to see this is short enough to begin to excite the vibrational. Here's the vibrational appearing. It gets down to 3.1 femtoseconds. You're getting a very strong excitation of vibrational. Here's 1.3 femtoseconds, and you can see there's a very strong signal uh, that, that remains there for a long time after the pulse has, has disappeared from, from the system. This is the Raman coherence representing the, the coherent motion of the molecules. And doing the experiment on this, you get a very dramatic result. We get um, a supercontinuum that extends uh, here from that some, this is in nanometers, so it's one micron right down to about 124 nanometers in this case, continuous. That big bump is the dispersive wave we talked about before. That's at about 180 nanometers. But you see there are other sidebands created here that, in fact, are caused by um, the Raman coherence acting like a phase modulator. But it's a phase modulator that's running at 125 terahertz. So hence, you can generate frequencies widely different from the frequency of the dispersive wave. Um, and to confirm that this, this is actually the case, and this, by the way, you don't often see this in these talks uh, about supercontinua. This is actually a linear scale. Um, and if we replace the hydrogen, this is the hydrogen result. We replace hydrogen with argon, keeping all the other conditions the same, same effective nonlinearity, the same zero dispersion wavelength. You can see there's practically nothing in this wavelength range in the vacuum ultraviolet if you use argon. So the Raman effect is really important here. Okay, so I have one, I've really, there are two more topics here, but, but what, the last one is really very, very short. Um, so the last thing I'd like to talk about is now I've, I've introduced Raman scattering a little bit. So we got the concept that we can create um, coherence in the molecular vibrations. We make them all vibrate in phase uh, in some sense. Um, and recently we've been, we've been using this to achieve broadband wavelength conversion. And this is by using a trick. It's a trick that happens it's not really a trick, it's, it's genuine. <laughs> it's, it's something that happens around a zero dispersion point. And it's well known, of course, you've seen this already in the discussion of the, the dispersive wave generation, that in the anomalous dispersion regime, the curvature is like this. In the normal dispersion re regime, it's like this. This is a frequency wave vector. Zero dispersion point is the red dot. And um, if we imagine that we pump a gas uh, around close to the zero dispersion point, so we pump with this frequency and we pump it hard enough so that we generate uh, some, a Raman signal in the Stokes frequency, so you generate a signal here. We then create in the gas, we create a coherence wave, which has a wave vector given by this length here and a frequency given by this, which is the Raman frequency. And what you're actually doing here is creating a, a, a Mexican wave, a Laola wave, or whatever you want to call it, the thing that you see in football stadiums when people sort of do this. And you see a wave going around the, the stadium. The people themselves don't move. They stay where they are. But you get the impression of a wave that's moving at any speed you want. Um, so that's what we're doing here. Where this, the beat note between the pump and the Stokes signal is driving a coherence wave which travels along. Uh, it's caused by the molecules being very carefully phased in the right way, temporally relative to each other, so as to create uh, a moving structure like that. So you, you create this wave, and then the idea is to use this as a kind of nonlinear hologram. So we jump over to the other side. We need phase matching to make use of this. But the beautiful thing about this S curve is that by jumping onto the lower frequency side in this case, we can use exactly the same coherence wave down here to couple uh, light, to convert light from this frequency to this frequency using that coherence wave. Um, it actually works really well. Here are some examples. Once again, this is pressure tunable. This is the beauty of this system. We can go from 30 atmospheres to 3 atmospheres. We can tune the shape of the dispersion curves. We're writing with 532 nanometers, generating a Stokes signal here. So these are the, these are the two writing frequencies, and we're able to read out in the, <clears throat> let's see, in the at lower frequencies or at higher frequencies just by varying the pressure. 
And in practice, this works really nicely. So this is at uh, about 30 atmospheres of hydrogen. We're writing with 532 nanometers. That's the first Stokes, the second Stokes signals. We're putting in a broadband signal here. So this blue thing is, the, is a supercontinuum signal that we're seeding into the system. We want to convert that to, to the higher frequency. You can see that the system has reduced the, this is a logarithmic scale. So we're getting something like 80% conversion of this broadband signal from this frequency range to this frequency range. So from about 250 terahertz out to 400 terahertz uh, with, with, with high efficiency. So this seems to be a nice way to uh, shift a broadband signal um, using Raman scattering. So just a little taster at the end. Um, I, I'm literally not going to talk about this for more than a minute, maybe. And this, this is a very recent thing that we've been playing with, and I call it a self-stabilized optomechanical nanospike. One of the nice things you can do with holocore fiber. So the idea here was to bring combined optomechanics with tapered fiber structures and with holocore fiber. And one of the things that anyone in fiber optics worries about is how to launch very high powers into, into a core. And, and a holocore, is, it's, it's the same question. It can be how much power can we get into the holocore and, and maintain high coupling efficiency and not actually damage anything. The idea here is you, you take a single mode fiber, you taper it down to a very narrow tip. The tip of this structure we've made down to 150 nanometers. And when the glass tip becomes as small as that, the mode that it guides has a, um, a mode field diameter that's very similar to the mode field diameter of the holocore itself. And then you're in a regime of uh, optomechanical back action. So the light is then, the, the, this tip finds itself sitting in the center of a mode and it's trapped there, it can't move away. And the higher the power is, the more firmly it becomes trapped by an optical spring effect. There's an optical spring effect here uh, that, that, that traps the, the, the nanospike in the core. So you could launch 100 watts or something in here, whatever you want, and, and you can perfectly, the, the more power the better for this, the more stable it is. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of other fascinating things to do with this system. This should appear this week, I think, in, in Optica, if you're interested in following it up. So. I hope that wasn't too fast. Um, uh, that's all I'd planned to talk about this morning. So thank you all very much for coming. <laughs>